Okay, moving on now. Mosaic plots. Oh, you see the first? There we go. Mosaic plots. Oh, that's what this says. We're going to learn about mosaic plots. Let's remember this principle because everybody needs to remember this principle. Uh, mosaic plots. A mosaic plot does exactly what a stacked or clustered bar chart does, but it does it in a different way. So if you have some data that are in a contingency table, a two by two table especially, you can choose a mosaic plot or a bar chart. Mosaic plots aren't quite as well known, but they're extremely useful. So a mosaic plot is kind of like a bar chart. And as a matter of fact, with one variable, it looks just like a stacked bar chart. But the plot is always a rectangle, and the rectangle is divided into sub-rectangles. And each rectangle, each little sub-rectangle, represents the number of cases in a combination of categories. So the number of cases in one cell of um, a two-way contingency table. You know, one category from this variable to the other. And the area of each rectangle, and this is the genius of the mosaic plot, is proportional to that frequency, to the number of cases in that little cell in that combination of things. Now, this was, it was just kind of frustrating and annoying to do before computers, but computers can do this blindingly fast, so why not do it? The simplest case is a single variable. So let's look at one variable here. This is survival rate on the Titanic. We saw this with a stacked bar chart, and in fact, this looks almost identical to a stacked bar chart. So nothing really going on here. This 1.1 is not important. I did this in R, and the R was a little confused that there was only one variable for this particular function, so it put something there, and I don't actually remember why it was 1.1. So back to those mosaic plots. Let's get more complicated, two variables. I think this is the most useful kind of mosaic plot. Sometimes three variables, but it gets confusing with three. So the data for this will come from a contingency table, just like a stacked or clustered bar chart. Here is survival rate by passenger sex. So one dimension, this dimension going this way, the up-down dimension, represents the number of males. So the total number of males is kind of the vertical block here. The total number of females is this vertical block. And this dimension is survival. So the gray top blocks mean didn't survive, and green bottom blocks mean did survive. Is that making sense? This is the number of females who did not survive. This area represents the number of females who did. This is males who did survive. This is males who did not. I could have turned it around so survivors on the top, um, but uh, I was in a little bit of a hurry and didn't want to rearrange all the data. So anyway, there we go. When you have more than two variables, you can do this, but it gets crazy. Each dimension, the height versus the width, there's only two dimension, gets subdivided, and it gets visually pretty nuts. So here's a whole bunch. On this side, you have sex and survival. Yes, no. So yes, no. Yes, no. And here you have class, first, second, third, and crew. And then within class, you have child, this teeny thing here, adult, and then child and adult, and child and adult, and child. And this line represents zero, and adult. So I think there were no children in the crew. That's good to know. I'm glad they weren't putting children to work in the engine room here. So you can kind of see what's going on, but and, and you can parse this. This can be useful if you're trying to make sense out of this. But I think once you get above two variables, it gets confusing fast. Sometimes three variables works. Not usually. Statisticians hate pie charts. I don't exactly know all the reasons why. But pie charts do make certain comparisons difficult to see and certain relationships difficult to see. On the other hand, I would argue that they're so common that a pie chart can be useful sometimes. A pie chart should generally be used when you have exactly one categorical variable. And then you can use the wedges of the pie to represent um, the frequency of observations in each category. There are lots and lots of other types of charts and graphs. Bazillions. Google is your friend. Um, one last detail. I've mentioned this before, but let's, have, let's revisit it. Some categorical data is ordered. And every once in a while, you find a reason to use a bar chart or a mosaic plot for an actual numerical variable if there are very, very few categories. But usually, you'll find yourself using categorical or ordered categorical. 
So if you have an order in some way in your data, remember it gets preserved in the chart. Some software, including R, screw this up because they want to do this. So I have the political affiliation of some participants in one of my studies, and I made a bar chart out of it without tweaking it. And it put the categories in alphabetical order. Every once in a while, you'll see this in a particularly inept graph in a magazine or a website or some student presentation. This is crazy. How are you supposed to make sense of this? The point of a graph is to help you organize and see patterns in the data. This doesn't help you with daily squat unless you look at it very, very carefully. This is really dumb. Now, a person wouldn't know this was dumb, and, they, and even if they saw it, they might not know how to fix it. So you have to know how to fix it so it looks like this. There's a clear order here. Very liberal to liberal to centrist to conservative to very conservative. I could have done it the other way with conservative, but it should be this order or a reverse of this order. Hey, here's this principle again. You think you need to see it? 